Okay, so we are going to go ahead and get started with the uh, presentation. Um, again, welcome to this month's uh, presentation of uh, Pigments 101, and we are going to focus on the uh, uh, micas and um, uh, as, as all, all our other ones, we will be recording this uh, session. It is going to be about a 30-minute presentation on the technical part, um, of course, with uh, about a 10 to 15-minute question and answer session uh, at the end. And you go ahead and use all the, uh, or use the chat button um, if you have a question uh, during the presentation um, for, uh, for, for us at the end. So our uh, subject, is, of course, is uh, the, the micas. And as far as a classification perspective, uh, they are part of the inorganic class of pigments uh, in, um, in the colored section. And we consider them uh, a synthetic uh, part of it uh, because of the bonding of the metal oxide um, uh, into the um, onto the surface of the mica, even though the, uh, the bulk of the micas are natural in, in essence, but because we chemically bond uh, to the platelet, that's why they're considered in the synthetic category. Uh, an effect pigment uh, is a particle uh, with directional uh, light reflection and scattering um, characteristics. It's usually a uh, plate, flat platelet-like particle, uh, but the key area here is it does cha uh, show change in lightness, hue, uh, and saturation with the viewing angle, and that's the key with respect to um, uh, micas is all dependent on the viewing angle um, that is being used. And why do we use an effect pigment? Um, effect pigments let manufacturers develop their own distinctive color uh, effect. Uh, the colors uh, support the balancing act between function, aesthetics, technology, and art. Customers buy not only for purely rational uh, purposes, but also with their heart. And depending on who the customer is, they'll they'll purchase differently. So for example, men and women uh, will, will uh, be attracted to something different. Um, age is another key area as far as uh, what, they're, what they're being attracted to and other characteristics that uh, people uh, normally have um, will, will guide them into uh, um, how they buy and what colors they choose. And studies have shown that around 75% 70 of buyers will choose a, an effect color regardless of the color that they choose. Um, so it's important to consider um, effect colors in your color designing area. Continuing on with uh, why using effect pigments, uh, they give a metallic glamour to your uh, to your, your part, whatever that part may be. Um, there's a two-tone uh, effect that, that's in there and the, um, the lightness will change again with the viewing angle. Sometimes you'll hear the word flop given for that particular aspect of it. Um, the, another key area is when you're designing a product, um, uh, effect pigments will enhance the perception of curvature. So consider um, the difference between a, a, an object with a sharp uh, cur uh, curve versus a, a more rounded curve. An effect pigment is going to enhance that different differentiations um, in the viewing of the color. Of course, it gives sparkle, um, depth perception, um, and intensifies the, the, the highlight colors that are, that are in there. <clears throat> Excuse me. The hue shift um, will change with the viewing angle. Again, viewing angle is the key with effect pigments. 
And of course, the saturation um, shift will also be different between the uh, with the viewing angle. And the visual that I've, I've given here is a, is a great example of all of these uh, aspects of it, where the orientation of the of the uh, flake um, in the part will give a, give your desired effect or uh, that you're looking for. In this particular case, um, the uh, the formulator was looking for the um, the movement of of the uh, of the color. Uh, so orientation in this particular case is they they want it to be random to be able to give that uh, that depth of color and the the uh, vi the, the effect of a visual movement of color. General characteristics of an effect pigment are usually defined by their particle size. And typically, the average di diameter is specified as a D50. Um, you might see that in some of the literature. Um, larger flakes, uh, depending on the, the, the part uh, that you're, uh, you're putting the color to, um, can uh, result in a poor appearance uh, due to protrusion of the flake. Um, but that is strictly uh, the thickness of the part um, dependent on that one. And in this area, smaller flakes uh, tend to not appear like a flake, more uh, like a silky uh, pattern when they're real small. The other key area to consider is in the particle size distribution. And uh, we typically specify that from the smallest to the largest diameter. And you might see that as a, either specified as a D5 to D95 or more usually it's uh, it specified as a D10 to D90 uh, in terms of the Gaussian curve. So an example might be a 5 to 25 micron or 10 to 60 micron in, in, in areas. It is interesting to note that uh, we can use uh, special processes to either make that uh, distribution more narrow or skew the distribution in to one side or the other. Um, to provide a unique um, uh, effect uh, for that one. So particle size distribution is one of the key areas with respect to uh, effect pigments. And the last area is um, the aspect ratio. Um, in other uh, sessions, we've talked about this before for the, um, because these are platelet, um, platelet uh, aspects, uh, the aspect ratio is uh, generally 10 to 1 to 100 to 1. So it, it falls in that uh, plate and, uh, and, and flake category that we spoke of earlier in other sessions. As far as pigment classes in general, um, the organic and inorganic pigments um, will be the absorption pigments where they uh, absorb all of the light. Uh, and the, the color does not change with viewing angle, and the color comes from the surface of that pigment. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, metal, metal effect pigments or aluminums, uh, they um, reflect 100% of the light because they are opaque to the light, and the brightness of, the, of that effect strongly depends on the angle of, of, of viewing. And then lastly, the, the last category, of course, is the pearlescent pigments. And here, you're gonna have a combination of uh, reflectance and transmiss transmission um, because these pigments are um, somewhat uh, 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 opaque and, and allow some of the light to transmit through. And here, the uh, color will be, ha will, it has a strong dependence on the angle and the depth of the, uh, of the viewing uh, also uh, enhances the color as well. Just some of, of the categories with respect to micas. The first category is, is, has been termed uh, interference uh, colors. These are those that are, co are, are coated with uh, titanium dioxide that is um, deposited onto the surface uh, and then calcined in place. Um, certainly a wide range of sizes that are available in this class of pigments. Uh, the effect that you get is a more of a highlight color 
uh, with a weak complementary colored flop. The color range uh, ranges from um, white or silver all the way through to green, um, being the the thickest uh, TiO2 um, of, of, the, of the class of pigments. Key thing to note here is these types of pigments uh, are translucent, so they uh, essentially have no hiding powder power. So that might be a positive or a negative in your formulation, depending on what uh, final formulation you are trying to achieve. And they do have excellent stability and durability. And their value to a, to a color formulator is they provide a pearly luster, luster uh, with a high chroma um, colored highlight. The second class um, is in uh, with uh, colored metal oxides being the, uh, the metal oxide of choice. Um, and they can be um, either um, interference or, or absorption or a combination of the two, depending on what is used for that metal oxides and or what combination of it. So typical metal oxides in this class are the are iron oxide and uh, chromium oxide. Sometimes you'll see a mixed metal oxide put on the surface. Um, and sometimes these might be mixed with uh, TiO2 as well in two different uh, flake um, or two different layerings. The, the effect that you get is uh, a, a medium color depth uh, with, uh, with intense uh, colored uh, highlight. Um, a small amount of flop uh, uh, versus the uh, interference that we just spoke about. And the color range is quite broad, anywhere from your grays uh, through the uh, earth tones um, up until uh, the, the blue and, and the green as well. This class does have a better hiding uh, than the interference pigments because of the colored metal oxides that are used. They too also have excellent stability and durability. And their value bring, uh, uh, brings in, of course, not only the color, but uh, a higher chroma and uh, improved uh, durability and spray latitude because of the um, colored metal oxides that are used. The last class um, is with the synthetic micas. And uh, essentially these are the same types of micas that we just spoke about, except for the, um, the, the substrate is a synthetic mica versus a natural mica. So the same types of metal oxide are fused onto the uh, platelets, the synthetic platelets. Um, the effects um, are, are the same types of color effects, except for with a, uh, a sharper, more crystalline uh, sparkle. And um, the uh, uh, color range is the same. Um, and they also might be a little bit more expanded because of the, uh, the, the, the cleanliness that you, that you get with a synthetic mica allows for potentially some in-between colors that you might not be able to achieve um, with a natural mica. Similar hiding, depending on the, on the, um, on the uh, mica uh, or the metal oxide used, again, excellent stability and durability. However, you will see a higher cost than the natural mica. And their value is in the, its in its higher chroma and unique a uh, higher sparkle over a natural mica base. The pearlescent pigments, of course, uh, we just uh, talked about the two different classes of substrates being synthetic or natural. Um, the natural micas, of course, they are mined out of the ground. Um, all over the globe are, are, are natural micas. 60% of the natural micas do, uh, are mined in India. So depending on where the mine source is, that's going to give a, a certain amount of um, natural contamination that brings some color to the, to the mica platelet itself, as you can see by this, uh, this visual here. So typically, the, uh, the, the, the mica source mines are 
are held consistent so that contamination and color is consistent as it comes through. And then conversely, the synthetic mica, because it is synthetic, uh, that provides a cleaner base uh, for, to work with um, when developing the color. This uh, animation is really uh, just a, a structure of uh, the TiO2 coated micas, um, where in the center is the mica platelet um, with the TiO2 bonded chemically to the surface of the, of the platelet. And then lastly, because these are platelets, they are um, multiple single layers uh, that are stacked together to form the ultimate final uh, particle that is uh, that, that, that you would purchase to put into your formulation. And so the light will travel through those multiple surfaces. A portion of that will be um, will be reflected and another portion will be transmitted to the next layer to give the color and the depth that you get out of, out of uh, the, the, the effect, effect pigments. As far as the coating is concerned, the, the key to the, to the color and the effect that you are seeing is all in the ref, refractive index of the different layers and surfaces that the light needs to transmit mit through. And so the mica platelet will have a refractive index of about 1.5. The metal oxide is about double that. And so with the light traveling through two different uh, refractive index surfaces, that is going to bend the light um, and, and provide that final, that final um, uh, color that you're looking for. So the light will travel through and depending on the thickness of the uh, metal oxide on the surface, a portion of that will be reflected back to your eye. The next, the, the remaining portion will be transmitted through and onto the next surface. And so as far as how do you get the different colors, the, co the, the coating thickness that's placed on the mica platelet determines what that color is. So the, the, the thinnest um, Mike, the, the thinnest TiO2 uh, would be the, your silver or your white uh, mica, followed by your yellow or gold, red, and blue, with your green um, mica being the, um, the thickest uh, TiO2 uh, on the surface of that particular one. So um, th there's an interesting to note that this, this uh, pathway um, the, would, is considered the first order uh, micas. There is a second order if you continue on with the depositing of the TiO2 onto the surface of the green, you're going to hit the second order micas. However, that's going to come back to the gold or the yellow. You'll never hit silver again. There's only a first order silver, but you will refollow the pathway from yellow to red to green or to blue to green again in that second order. As you can imagine, with the extra thickness of the TiO2, uh, the second order micas are more of a rarity um, because it's a, obviously a little bit more difficult from a manufacturing perspective, and of course that difficulty will result in some additional uh, cost. However, there is a, a higher chroma that, that, that comes with that additional uh, layering in there. And then similarly with the uh, iron oxide treated micas, you'll, you'll start with the bronze, the copper and maroon. If you go a little further, you'll hit a red. And then if you combine the two um, in, the, in the gold area, uh, the, the thickness of the TiO2 and the iron oxide will determine the, the ultimate color of the, uh, of the final product. Uh, and you can, you can manipulate that color from a more of a green shade to a more of a red shade, depending on the thicknesses of those, of those layers.
We talked about the, uh, the coding concept and um, the layering differences. This is just a little bit of an animation to show how the layers um, impact, the, the, the light go, transmits through the layers. So if we follow the path of, of this blue mica here, the light will come in, a portion of that will be reflected back to your eye as a blue color. The other portion will be transmitted through and become a yellow uh, in color. That, that stream would then trans, uh, uh, go into the next layer in that platelet as a yellow, and then it will be reflected back um, or transmitted through as a blue and, reflect, uh, uh, and so forth down the line through the entire surface of, uh, of, of, the, of the actual particle itself. The last little piece that I wanted to, to, um, sh to share with you with respect to the coatings concept would be um, the key points in terms of the, the different uh, index of refraction that the light will have to pass through. So the light will start through the air, which uh, has the, uh, a, a refraction of, of one. Then it needs to go through the, uh, the polymer that is holding the, the mica in place, which we've generally ter de termed as a, a 1.5 ref refractive index. And then it hits the first surface of the TiO2 resin uh, boundary layer. Uh, and then a portion of that will be reflected back. A portion of it will be transmitted through to the second TiO2 uh, uh, boundary with the mica, again, where the refractive index then changes again um, back into there. So this is how the light that, that enters into the, into the um, mica flake gets, uh, gets transmitted back um, to your eye as, as a certain color. And again, just some visuals on the, on the, um, the layering and how the, uh, the light impacts to get you, to, to provide you that final color. And similarly, the, um, the iron oxide coated had the same type of phenomena and you can see how the, um, the, the color uh, thickness of the iron oxide results in the final color. With these, because they are uh, absorption type colors, the, uh, the light will both um, be reflected and absorbed um, as well as transmitted. In terms of the uh, mica size and how that impacts um, the sparkle brightness and coverage, uh, the finer uh, micas are going to have the smallest amount of, of, of sparkle uh, as well as brightness, but they will also uh, provide you with the best coverage or hiding uh, because of the, the total surface area that you'll get with the uh, per volume of, of material used in your formulation. Conversely, uh, the coarser ones will provide you with the most sparkle. Um, the most brightness, but however, it'll be the uh, provide the, the least amount of of uh, coverage uh, or hiding. Uh, and these are some some product examples that uh, I wanted to share with you so that you can get a better visual of that impact. So on the left hand side, you have the the finest uh, of products, and you can see how well the opacity is but how, how little the amount of sparkle um, and brightness that you can get with that particular pigment. And then if you uh, compare that to the larger size, you can see the, uh, the, the extreme difference in coverage um, as well as the sparkle with the larger ones. So depending on what your end uh, result and formulation um, is desired, you may want to use a, a combination of, of micas uh, bringing in some of the finer ones to, to, to give you some hiding, um, but yet bringing in maybe the, some of some larger ones to, to provide some of that sparkle that you might need um, or want in your formulation. 
the last item would be with respect to uh, uh, the substrate itself. We, we already talked about the difference between the synthetic and the natural. Natural mica um, will have a more limited amount of chroma and sparkle um, with respect to uh, the given size range. And uh, they will, uh, of course, be a little bit lower in cost. Um, conversely, the, the synthetic one will, because, uh, because of their cleanliness, um, that allows for additional uh, chroma to, to, uh, to, to exhibit in the final product. Um, the, clean, the clean edges um, provide some, some uh, much more clean and crisp sparkle um, uh, for that particular product. But as we mentioned, with the, uh, with the synthetic also comes a higher cost in utilization. So typically a combination of both natural and synthetic um, is used to, uh, to optimize the properties and effects, but yet to, um, to uh, bring the cost position um, closer, in, in, to get, uh, closer in line to what's, what's desired. Guidelines for using uh, micas. Um, the, you know, the one thing that I will say is, uh, and I'll, I repeat it three times, orientation, orientation, and orientation. Um, that's the key for micas or any effect pigments. Um, that no matter which uh, application you're using the, mica, the, the micas in, um, the, the more the, the, the flake is oriented uh, parallel to the substrate, the more effect that you will receive for that particular one. Uh, you can't increase the sparkle by just increasing the, the concentration. You have to uh, either widen the particle size distribution um, by, um, by adding in a larger and a smaller, combining the two, or, uh, or, or skewing the um, particle size distribution to the larger to the to the larger or the smaller depending on which direction you want to go um, most micas are, are are more on the transparent translucent side so hiding can be an issue or it can be a, a positive depending on um, your end goal for formulation um, um, in plastics this might be a, a positive uh, uh, aspect of it as well. As far as um, mixing uh, effect pigments and micas with, with other pigments, um, it's always going to be a challenge to get the most out of your, out of your pigments um, and get as well as achieve the color and effect that you're, you're ultimately looking for. Uh, so interference colors, uh, the mi color mixing is additive but subtractive for absorption colors. And with respect to micas, a black or a dark background will absorb the, the color more, so you'll see more of the actual color itself, whereas the, a whiter or light background will reflect the uh, transmitted color more. And the, and, your, and the combination with other products Again, as far as the uh, the other pigments in in the in your in your formulation, you want them as to be as transparent as possible for the maximum color and effect from that mica pigment. Um, as you bring in more opaque pigments, um, you're going to lose that 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 color and effect uh, from your mica pigment. And lastly. Um, uh, these uh, these require some gentle handling. They don't require um, any just type of uh, physical dispersion process. Um, they are mix in, stir in type of applic uh, ap uh, application um, because we want to maintain that platelet integrity. From a uh, manufacturing perspective, it, it's a, a really a pretty simple uh, process. The key areas are um, in the, in the uh, mica grinding and classification. That is uh, the, the, the key to getting the, the end result um, because you want to make sure that we have the right average particle size as well as the correct uh, distribution that we're looking for for that particular product. And then the metal oxides are uh, Placed on the, um, the the substrate in the uh, in the reactor. Of course, 
time, temperature um, in that in, in that mixing reaction is what get, gives the uh, the final color that we're looking for. Followed by the 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 filter press to to remove the bulk of the water, and then a a dryer to to continue that uh, drying process before it hits the kiln for the calcination, which then converts um, the the uh, the metal um, ox uh, to the to the final metal oxide. And then coming out of the kiln, the products are blended for, uh, for the end um, qualification perspective and packaged. And I just added in here uh, for those that are interested to see a, a, a PEM photo of, a, um, of the metal oxide that's bonded to, the, to the, uh, the platelet surface so that you can get a better feel for ultimately what these uh, look like um, in the in the surface. So that thickness of uh, metal oxide is what dictates the color. A little bit more uh, specifics as far as the the process uh, is concerned. Um, the uh, the uh, the mica, as I said before, the mica grinding um, is is very is is the key area to make sure that we get the right size particle uh, size and size distribution, and um, the uh, the um, for the for the final product. Of course, the coating, as I mentioned many times, uh, is the thickness of that coating depicts the color. Um, the material is then washed and cleaned. Um, to have to, to have contamination-free particles before it uh, follows into the drying and calcination process. In that calcine process, I, I know I had a, a specific temperature in there, but that temperature and time can can alter depending on the uh, the surface that we put on, um, and it could also have multiple uh, uh, processes if there's multiple uh, t uh, multiple. Uh, a layer metal oxide layers uh, in there, which which then um, uh, dictates what the uh, the color, ultimate color, platelet thickness, and particle size distribution. And then if if it's required for the final application, the uh, particle the the there's a surface treatment that could be added um, um, before it's uh, it's the final blending and. Um, and and, uh, and packaging. Sorry, there I lost my train of thought there. Um, as far as uh, surface treatments and encapsul or encapsulation is another term for it. Uh, we use it to slow the uh, or prevent an undesirable reaction from occurring, um, such as photo de degradation or hum humidity effects. We could also use it to change the rheology of a system to improve dispersion or compatibility with the system. It's also used to improve overall uh, performance like durability and adhesion. And also we can define, we can design it to uh, reduce or eliminate a, another undesirable effect uh, in the formulation. For example, we can accelerate or inhibit um, a cure or a, uh, a setup of, the, of, the, of that final formulation. So there are many ways that you can use a surface treatment uh, for your end, end application. Um, as I mentioned, the primary um, aspect uh, or metal oxides that are used in uh, micas are titanium dioxide and iron oxide. And we all know that titanium dioxide will undergo uh, photocatalytic degradation, impact, uh, impacting the color. And uh, so a surface treatment can in, uh, in, in inhibit that reaction from, from going. Um, I give a little bit of an example of uh, the mica or the, the metal oxide type with respect to um, delta E uh, in terms of weatherability. So I, a silver mica, uh, which is just TiO2 and the thinnest version of it. Um, in this particular example, has nearly a three uh, delta E in this example, whereas um, an iron oxide coated bronze mica, which is the thinnest in that in that class, uh, would have a two delta 
uh, delta E for that same time period. So the metal oxide does play a role in, in that particular area and we can use a surface treatment for, uh, for uh, impeding that. And then of course, uh, uh, especially for, from a coatings perspective, uh, the, the high aspect ratio of the micas um, can lead to some wicking action of bo both within the, um, within the platelet itself as well as uh, within the film um, while, while releasing moisture. So having the, uh, a substrate or a surface treatment on, on, this, on the surface can help um, to wick away, the, especially in, in, in waterborne systems, to wick away the water through the film, uh, but also to prevent uh, moisture from the atmosphere from getting into the, uh, to this, to the mica itself. Different types of surface treatments. Um, there's an anti-yellowing um, that is used uh, primarily for silvers for exterior plastic applications. There are several for, that are used in the coatings applications, uh, one containing chrome, one's chrome free. Um, they each have their positives and negatives with respect to, uh, to the ultimate application. And uh, of course, there are many different types of silanes and coupling agents that can also be used to improve uh, dispersibility. In summary, uh, the, the pearlescent pigments can uh, add a, a unique uh, look to your formulation, but they might have um, some, some negative impacts on, your, on a particular formulation that can be solved. Unfortunately, there's no universal treatment for all applications. Um, the surface, once you understand what the fail, failing uh, mechanism is in your, in your system, then the uh, formulation, uh, surface treatment formulation can be developed to be able to um, fix that failure. Um, and that fix might uh, might be positive or uh, or or negative or minimal to, um, to to that other application properties, but uh, if you carry that over to another application, it might have negative impacts. Um, thus, going back to the statement that there's no universal treatment for all applications. And lastly, ultimately, um, you would want to design the uh, a, a a, uh, a, a unique uh, app surface treatment for your application um, so that you can match the, uh, the treatment to your, to your, uh, to your formulation um, to get the ultimate uh, performance advantage. Just a quick statement about uh, where Sudershan fits in the, um, in, in the, in the age-old uh, child labor uh, with respect to, to sourcing of mica. Uh, we have a zero tolerance, of, of course, uh, with respect to child la labor, and um, I, I put a link to our website that provides some additional information um, and details about how Sudershan is um, working with, with it within the organizations that are developed to, to prevent uh, child labor uh, from impacting all of our raw materials and manufacturing. And lastly, just a couple of acknowledgements. Um, uh, again, I can't do these presentations without the help of um, the, uh, the R&D team, especially uh, Kailash Magore, who has been our, our, my direct lead and the lead for, for MICAs, as well as our, our uh, product technical service team um, that helps us to do the evaluations um, for, for all the applications that we work within. Um, next up is uh, we're skipping obviously the with the holidays we're skipping in Jan in December so our next one will be in January where we're going to have uh, begin our, our series on high performance pigments uh, focusing on the DPP chemistry and then uh, in February and March I'm going to do a two part series with respect to azos uh, where the first part will be for the yellows and the second part will be for oranges and reds. Uh, here's the information with respect for our North American team. If you have any questions, uh, this is, uh, will help you reach out to uh, the, the application area of your, of your choice. 
And lastly, if we have any questions, uh, we can entertain them now. Uh, and I do thank you for your participation. Uh, I don't see any questions uh, in here, but uh, please feel free to, uh, to let us know if you have any questions. I have a question. Sure. Um, so I'm Joe Morales from PPG Cleveland. Mm -hmm. I, um, when, we, when we make a, a slurry, an aluminum slurry, we add the mica to that slurry. Will that change the particle size or the surface treatment at all by cowsing um, mica into the slurry or should it be added without the cow's blade? Ideally, uh, well, so uh, you're not gonna lie. So the, so, the, so the answer to that is depends. So um, if you're, if you're, if you've got a pretty aggressive cow's blade in, uh, in, your, in your system or you're at a high, at a high uh, RPM rate, you do run the risk uh, of, of impacting the actual flake itself um, as far as the, the, the integrity. Um, it will not um, disrupt the surface treatment um, um, because that's, that's, that's chemically bonded onto the surface. It's not a mixed type of a thing. Uh, so, so that will be fine, but you do run the risk, especially if, if you are using um, some potentially larger flakes um, to, to, uh, to um, uh, breaking the platelets for the right one. So my, my suggestion would be more of a, like a paddle blade type of a, of a, of, of, of a mixing scenario versus a, uh, a high speed disperser cow's blade. Hey, thank you very much. We You're enjoy your, your presentation. Oh, no problem. Are there any other questions? Hi, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, one of your slides mentioned that um, you could use the pearlescence to improve dispersibility. What, what did you mean by that? Uh, so in this particular, in that particular example, it was using um, surface treatments and surface treatment chemistry to help with disperse dispersibility. Oh, okay, of itself, right? Of, 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 it, of itself into whatever medium it's going into. Oh, okay, thank you. I think I just misunderstood. Thank no, you. No, that's no problem. However, the, uh, the, the, if the, the, the physical um, stru uh, structure of the platelet because it is a, 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 a larger particle versus the other one, it does allow for an improvement of what, what I'll call um, separation of the other pigments in the, in, the, in, the, in the system. So for example, you've got, you know, if you're making a, a, a red paint, you're gonna have uh, some, some uh, red particle, pigment particles in there that have been previously dispersed. So having the mixture of um, organics and inorganics along with the, the micas, um, those micas will keep the, the uh, will, will also help the, the, the interaction of the other organics and inorganics in the system from interfering with each other, kind of a barrier, if you will, for lack of a better term. So that, not, that's not necessarily a a, a dispersibility improvement aspect of it, but I call it a more of a, a stabilization of the of the uniform uh, mix. Okay, is that more related to float, or is that more like separation sinuresis? More more separation of uh, in there. So you physically have a barrier of 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 that of that mica in between different differing chemistry pigments and or and or dispersions that might be on them um, in there so there is some stability improvement with respect to having the the um, that physical barrier of the of the flake um, helping keeping things apart there is a question on the chat it says uh, when the TO2 layer or metal oxide is being applied, what controls the final thickness? Um, so you're, you're right, it's, it's, it's time and, and temperature in that reactor kettle uh, with, the, with the, the basic uh, metal oxide. So the TIO2 is a, a 
a, a, tetra, a titanium tetrachloride is, is the base material. So the time and temperature of that, of that mix as it's mixing um, is, is very specific for the, the ultimate color that we, um, that we want to achieve at the end. And then of course, that married up with the kiln uh, calcination time and temperature, uh, which converts that to the TiO2. Uh, those two processes together um, are very specific for the final color. Are there any other color or questions? Okay. Oh, there, there comes one. Let's see. Uh, you mentioned that orientation of the mica is very important to the effect properties. Do they tend to orient it on their own or is this reliant on additive package? Um, so the, uh, boy, that's a loaded question, but uh, they, will, they will orient on their own if given the, the appropriate amount of time um, and the surrounding environment is, is, has the right rheology part of it. Um, but typically, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the orientation time is, is, is very specific on the application. If you want to compare and contrast a, uh, a liquid coating versus a plastic, um, you've got, a, um, in a liquid coating, you've got uh, film shrinkage, and, and evaporation of the, uh, of the solvents coming off. And both of those are going to um, be negatively impacting the, 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 uh, the orientation because as, the, as, the, as the, uh, the, the solvents want to come out of the film, it's going to want to push up the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the film or the, the mica. So um, either you want to have that shrinkage uh, be fast as well as the uh, the, the orientation, but um, in most cases, additives are used to help orient that uh, those flakes um, fairly quickly. Okay, um, if there are no other questions, uh, we've uh, hit about our time here, but certainly um, when you get the, uh, the presentation, if uh, additional questions should come up, please feel free to, uh, to, to connect with me and uh, we'll get you your answer. And again, we really wanted to thank you for participating um, today and um, Look for us uh, in, at the end of January for our next session on uh, the DPP pigment chemistries. So thank you very much for, for joining us and have the great rest of your day and uh, into your holiday season. Thanks again. Thank you, thank you Bonnie. Thanks, Bonnie. Oh, you're thank welcome. You, Bonnie, as always, great job. Thank you everyone for joining.